I think we're going to start. We have one time tonight. We have a very packed program. Uh, I'm Jim Perry. I'm in Perry Media Studies writing. and the commentators. Uh, I do want to say that this is a collaboration between two programs, um, CMSW and um, Art, Culture, and Technology, ACT, and, and uh, a new series for exploring some of the ways in which we can collaborate on some of these subjects of uh, contemporary importance and mutual interest. Um, Sasha is a scholar, activist, media maker, and will introduce uh, Marissa, introduce uh, Marissa, and is currently Associate Professor of Civic Media at MIT. They're a faculty associate of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, and faculty affiliate with the MIT Open Documentary Lab and the MIT Center for Civic Media. Um, Sasha's first book, Out of the Shadows, Into the Streets, uh, was on transmedia organizing immigrants right now. <coughs> and that was published in 2014 by the Press. Uh, we'll have two responses tonight. Uh, first, uh, Jane Sachs, who is a creative collaborator, works out of Chicago as an arts producer, writer, and educator, and works on challenging uh, champ uh, and championing issues um, of gender, sexuality, human rights, uh, <coughs> civil rights. She's uh, been a lecturer at uh, Yale and will be a lecturer at Harvard soon in the future. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, and is also uh, president and artistic director of Project uh, <coughs> Stamp, which is an organization that creates new models of cultural participation and experience. So the emphasis of this whole series is on practice, art practice as a way of addressing uh, serious contemporary issues and trying to use art to leverage uh, social awareness, social imagination, stimulate social imagination, stimulate new thinking about uh, some of the massive number of issues that we're all facing today. Uh, our second <coughs> uh, respondent will be Steve Seidel, who holds a uh, Patricia Bauman and John Landrum Bryant Chair in Arts in Education at the Harvard Grad School of Education. He's the faculty director of the Arts in Education program and a former director of the Project Zero. Uh, his current research includes talking with artists who teach a study of working artists' ideas and insights into the nature of artistic development and learning. So um, I'll turn it over to Sasha now who will introduce Marissa. Thank you. Everyone, so welcome. Uh, it's, what should I use? Oh, you, you can use my Hello, is that better? Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm really, really excited uh, to introduce uh, Marisa Moran Jan. Um, I'm not going to read or, uh, or recite her biography to you because you probably did that when you decided to come to the event. Um, you can find it online. So I thought it might be good instead to just share uh, an anecdote or a little uh, story about uh, our past collaborations and how we came to know each other. So we actually met first in 2008. Um, we were both participating in Eyewitness Video, which was a sort of uh, citizen journalism uh, video and documentary collaborative that uh, we gathered together in the Twin Cities in 2008 to provide uh, grassroots coverage of the uh, Republican National Convention that was meeting in 2008 at the time. Uh, the RNC in the Twin Cities uh, as you can imagine, it was, a, it was heavily militarized. There were thousands of riot police. There was lots of 
tear gas floating through the streets of, uh, of St. Paul and, and the Twin Cities. There was uh, intensive, uh, there was, you know, it turned out later that there had been an infiltration process where the FBI had infiltrated some of the key organizing um, groups that were involved in putting together the protests against the Republican National Convention, and some of the FBI agents had come up with a plan to, um, um, I don't know, to violently attack police in the convention center, and they had, of course, come up with this idea and found the materials and basically had been plants to make all this happen. So we were there, we, we arrived, um, we both had been sort of asked to come participate because of previous work we had done in media arts, in community journalism, and with the Indie Media Network, uh, the Independent Media Center's uh, network of radical grassroots storytellers and journalists that emerged uh, during the late uh, 1990s prior to the existence of social media. Um, and we had both been part of that, that network. And so my first experiences with Marisa were um, kind of in this intensive uh, situation of heavy police repression. Um, and we, I remember we formed small teams of videographers and spotters to go out and document what was happening. My goal here was to make a documentary and it was also to provide footage that could be used as legal evidence for the legal teams that were gonna get people out of the bogus charges that we knew the police were gonna throw on people um, for peacefully protesting. And so I remember sort of going out into the streets and we were taking turns shooting footage and uh, swapping out um, mini DV tapes. Do you remember those? Do you remember mini, mini DV tapes? Okay. So we had to carry around the mini DV tapes. There was a whole system for like turning in the tapes because we knew that police were targeting um, sort of social movement videographers. And so we had a drop, drop points all around the protest zone where you would hand in the tapes. And so we were sort of working together to try and document this stuff, get coverage, not get clubbed or gassed too much. Um, and I'm telling this story um, partly to establish Marissa's street cred as her, her background in the global justice movement, but also because what I do remember from this time um, is that if, you, if you're if you gonna be collaborating with someone to do some type of project or do some type of work, you want someone who's really paying attention both to what's going around, going on in the environment around you, what's taking place in the broader sort of scene, the broader ecology, the broader space, and you also want someone who's gonna be really kind of looking out for you and literally has your back. And uh, that was definitely my experience with Marisa at that time. Um, I felt like this was someone that I could really um, you know, trust to, to have that environmental awareness um, help uh, sort of navigate and move as a team through this quite violent and dangerous space in a process of media production um, that was a collaborative process that had many, many people involved um, and that we felt like was important because of the um, the, the values that we were there to stand up for, values of democratic participation and peaceful protest and so on and so forth. Um, from that time forward, I went on to collaborate uh, with Marisa on a couple other projects, and each time I had a very sort of similar experience. Like This is somebody who is a media artist, who is incredibly talented, who works with some of the most uh, marginalized uh, communities, um, not to quote unquote give voice, but to actually use processes of participatory design and collaboration to um, to amplify and extend and help build community power through media arts projects. Um, she's someone who always gives credit to everybody in the process in ways that are unfortunately, I think, too rare in the type of um, often sort of like ego-driven environments of uh, both media as a field and also uh, cultural theory and artistic practice. Um, so I would say, you know, if you need someone who's going to have your back, Marisa is that person. And if you want someone who's going to be doing uh, uh, participatory, community-led, artistic production uh, practices in ways that really, really are about recognizing and lifting up uh, the value that everybody's bringing to the space, um, again, um, she is your person. So with that, um, I guess that's all I have to say. And thank you so much for being here. We're incredibly honored and privileged to have you with us. Um, so take it away. It's a perfect segue um, to this first slide. And so 
I graduated um, during the time when there's an economic recession is just starting, which meant that I had uh, the fortune of um, being as there was very few jobs being available uh, to me with my art degree, um, I took on a number of jobs, including um, that all became important to me later. So I cared for someone in a wheelchair. I did woodworking and ran a woodworking construction business for seven years. Um, during that time, we saw a lot of things like um, well, when we installed sheetrock, the sheetrock, um, which is made out of this, uh, has sil it's silicon based. Um, after we would put up these walls and sand them down, then immediately the next day I would get sick and be, you know, sick for a couple of days. And so I became aware later of, um, you know, there's not enough um, tightening of those health and safety standards for for workers because it would make the cost of um, construction and real estate go up. Um, or for example, one time the wheel, the saw on um, the table saw came flying out and flew to the rafters. Uh, luckily did not hurt anybody, um, but I was just all, you know, I became really aware about the hazards on a workplace. Um, I also worked as an advocate for street vendors and also as a media advocate with the organization that Sasha um, had mentioned. Um, so these are some of the um, you know, the goals was to um, raise awareness in the public and amass evidence that could be used um, to end and curb undemocratic things like illegal surveillance and excessive force and infiltration by the police and infringement on the right to peacefully assemble and the harassment of the press. So, um, so my art background and the sundry jobs um, led me to founding Studio of Rev, which is a nonprofit, and we co-design public art and creative media with and for low-wage workers, immigrants, youth, and women. So some of the projects that we created include, um, we have done a number of tools. Um, including this one called Contratado, Sasha was um, a collaborator, as well as um, Centro de los Derechos del Migrante, which is an advocacy organization that advocates on behalf of the 90,000 um, H2A and H2B workers who come in from, um, to come and work in seasonal occupations here in the US, like crab uh, harvesting or uh, working in fields. Um, the majority are uh, from Mexico and there's um, rampant abuse in the, the workplace. So this is a Yelp site where uh, workers can rank and rate their employers. Um, it also functions then as a job, you know, a tool for job seekers. And um, our role was in creating these audio novellas as well as these uh, comics. Um, this is a project that is just about to come out. Um, it is, uh, do you guys know those maps that you get on the subway? You kind of unfold accordion like, like this. They're called Z-fold maps. So um, we have been working with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs on these maps that use Eng English language learner strategies to provide new immigrants with resources about immigration, mental health services, participatory budgeting, and more. So they're Distribution is through hundreds of community centers and English language learner communities throughout New York City. And we're using the language of birds because bird, birds are migratory. So um, in that project and a lot of the work that I do, um, this theme of hospitality comes up and up. Um, because um, my parents are immigrants, I, it's, it's just a kind of an incredible, um, kind of an incredible journey to get here and establish oneself and so forth. And um, the theme of hospitality also figures into um, this project, um, which is a book that I published about artists embedded in government industries and electoral cycles. So the artists are using and adopting the language patterns and symbols of the larger institution in which they're embedded in order to make the work itself. Um, and actually, I'll pass that around as, along with the next one, so if you can take a peek. Um, 
Um, Pro Agonist is a book that is um, about productive friction. And um, if antagonism is about oppositionality, says Foucault, then um, agonism is about uh, mutual incitement and struggle, so embracing struggle. Um, is written in black and blue, the colors of a good bruise, and it has a half inch hole in it. Um, actually, if you have it, can you raise it up so you can see there's an actual hole in it? Um, the idea about a principal tenet of agonism is that about embracing the other. So here, the half inch hole is so you can frame the other and keep them with you as you read along. Um, so now I'll go into projects in a more extended fashion. Um, among the many jobs that I took um, when I graduated from undergrad was teaching kids in school, in public schools as well as after school, school settings. Um, and my particular interest was in teaching literacy through art. Um, and uh, it, I had students that were, um, that were faced with these challenges. So these were the kids who kind of came to my classroom. Um, and this Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence appealed to me and I thought was interesting or helped me think through these different strategies. Um, so according to the theory, um, the, you know, there's different kinds of intelligences we tend to, and especially in traditional schools, tend to emphasize the top two, mathematical, logical, and verbal linguistic. Um, and a lot of the kids that I, were coming to my classroom had other skills and other strengths. And so if I could leverage those, then they would get excited about literacy. So um, a friend of mine in Honduras invited me to um, come do a project on, in Honduras. And she said, you have to come. They have the largest library there in northern Honduras. And so I went to go see this library, and it was um, a bookshelf long. So my goal was to um, encourage, um, will spark people's excitement about reading and encourage literacy. So here's the project that we did.
um, I should mention that um, that project, uh, we, I staged it with this community first eight years ago. And I didn't know at the time that community, which is up in the hills, they have very bad cell phone reception, um, and you'd have to come down the hill and you know, call someone on your cell phone. Um, so we didn't have, um, and they didn't have very much email. Um, so I didn't have regular communication with them. And a year and a half after we did it, I was talking with one of the organizers, and they um, casually said, oh, it's Bibble Bandita Week. And I was like, what's that? And she said, oh, you know, da, da, da. So she told me that they'd been carrying on this tradition and doing these kind of serialized episodic plays, um, like skits and inventing new characters and so forth. Um, so I think why that project um, worked, or what is sticky about it, um, was that it's, um, it's used this strategy of white labeling, which is that um, you know, uh, it's easily adaptable, um, and it can take uh, a life on its own without me being there. And so, um, at, you know, in the United States, uh, the Seattle Public Library adopted Bibel Bandido as their mascot for their digital media programs, um, and they do this annual teacher librarian training to, six, to 60 individuals who then adapt Bibel Bandido for their own needs. So it's carrying on um, without me. Um, this is a recent exhibition in central Harlem where there's a 30% 30 30 of the middle schoolers are um, below the standard uh, literacy rate. Um, and um, I think for me it's a guiding project also. Um, and because it fits into, um, well, Arabian Nights is for me a guiding North Star. And Bibel Bandito, for me, kind of fits this, um, what this did. So Arabian Nights was developed over many millennia um, by women over several continents. Um, so it's this collaborative and ongoing story with a, fr a frame tale with different stories tucked in between. Um, in another project, which is also a frame tale, um, I have been an artist and resident with the National Domestic Workers Alliance um, for the past um, eight years. And um, uh, for context for this collaboration, um, you may know that in the 1930s and 40s is when most workers received basic rights like minimum wage and days of rest and overtime wage. Um, but domestic workers and farm workers were excluded from receiving the same rights because at that time they were largely African American and southern lawmakers would not, would not pass those laws unless they were excluded. Um, and so this legacy of, um, you know, of injustice persisted until um, the 90s when domestic workers started organizing, telling their stories to lawmakers in Albany. Um, and in 2010, passed the nation's first domestic workers bill of rights. Um, and to get the word out to the 200,000 domestic workers, so nannies, housekeepers, and caregivers, in New York, um, we created this audio novella uh, app. You call in 347 work 500 on any kind of phone. This is the time before smartphones were accessible. And you'd hear what sounds like click and clack and card talk, but for nannies. Um, and when other states started passing their Bill of Rights um, to meet domestic workers where they're at, we created this mobile studio called the Nanny Van. And myself and uh, my friend Anjum and my newborn son um, would team up with domestic worker advocacy groups around the country and we'd come to unpack and we would do these um, sessions where we would exchange information and parlay what we had learned. So it's this kind of fluid um, you know, sharing of resources and so forth. And we would create different kinds of things along the way. So we continue making these audio novella apps um, we sometimes made these paper toolkits, we call them. So I spent a lot of time reading through laws and thinking about how they could be simplified or made funny even, um, or accessible. Um, I was doing a lot of recordings and interviews and I produced four songs that feature the songs of domestic workers, which are featured in the film that you'll hear shortly. Um, and we also started choreographing these dances 
So the dances, um, a lot of the domestic workers that we were working with, particularly like Filipina or Latina women, um, were really familiar with um, like kind of group and line dancing. And so we then started using that as a medium to fold in information and convey history or rights, um, and also as a way to prompt them to share what they knew. Um, so the, the movements essentially kind of encode this information. And it was a lot of fun. And you know, people learn it because they're laughing. Um, and, and then we also started playing um, with graphics. This is something I produced that has been in a few museum spaces and used in social media. And um, at the time when my son was born, um, I started reflecting on um, what are the best um, and most impactful ways that we were reaching people. Um, this is our audience engagement plan in which I'm, you know, we, I sat down with my collaborators and we charted out, okay, well, this piece of media is used for this, appeals to this demographic, and you know, a lot of the workers are using Facebook for this thing, but not, um, but not for this kind of information. So this is a way to both get on board with our partners as well as um, figure out what is lacking. Um, and so we started recognizing the role of, I mean, despite that I previously had like sculptures and installations in museums, but um, I, I then started recognizing that as domestic employers, you know, like myself, who spend time in museums, you kind of have this captive audience. So I used the language of WPA era posters, which is also the same moment when workers were excluded from receiving the same rights. And I made these silkscreen um, prints. Um, and I was using, you know, these WPA poster strategies of being explicitly didactic um, and conveying wonky things that I wanted people to be angry about or like change um, or inspired by. Um, so, um, and then further to, in order to appeal to domestic employers, um, we um, created this film, which is 24 minutes long, and it comes in four parts, um, for P that went on PBS Digital, and um, this is the first episode. My name is Marissa John. I'm an artist, teacher, and mom. This 1967 Burger Day wagon is a Care Force One, inspired by some of the incredible caregivers I've met. One was a huge hit locally in New York City. 
Then one day I got a phone call from Miami. That sounds amazing. That sounds really exciting. Well, first of all, yes, I would love to bring the care of car there in Miami. I mean, he gets a little car sick at night. I can't really have a good car that for that you know longer than it does, but I think we're just gonna have to make it work. So Anja, Joko, and I are going on an adventure from New York City to Miami to lead a day of celebration with and for some of our domestic worker friends at a world class museum. There is one problem. Um, so this question of um, success comes up, like how do you define it and what are your goals? Um, and on the one hand, we know things like um, 1,200 people called in per month um, on the audio novella app without, you know, in the first uh, few years without um, any advertising except for word of mouth. Um, we know that we, with the project all together, we um, were able, you know, we got media coverage. Um, it should be said that, um, I felt that whenever the pro, uh, whenever um, our work was in the news, the thing um, I didn't care if they got they included my name. I don't care if they got the project um, interpreted incorrectly. Um, what the goal that we established with our partners was, um, as long as they used the word domestic worker or domestic employee, it was doing the work that we wanted to do. So that was a win for us. Um, we also, um, yeah, we presented it also in a number of, um, you know, like the Department of Labor who asked us, um, the kinds of workers that you reach are ones that are, you know, they're not counted in the official workforce, and so we actually don't know how to reach them. Um, so that was important. Um, we know that, for example, um, we've, we recognize that it's like, it wasn't so much the eyeballs on the video itself that were doing impact work, as like when I was doing screenings, and also when there's social media around it, um, that was doing the work that we wanted to do with this project. Um, so we did a tweet chat, um, which um, we were surprised to find it trending um, just below Janice and Justice Kennedy um, on June 27th. Um, so uh, on a personal level, there's a number of people who would tell me, um, you know, I never identified as a nanny, and I've been doing this work for 15 years, until I walked by the nanny van, um, or until I encountered this project. Um, so people, yeah, so, or, or like domestic employers who would say, um, you know, I'm thinking of an individual who is, works at a museum, is super conscientious individual, um, his daughter is in a wheelchair, and he, his family has relied on caretakers, and so, you know, I just haven't thought about the history of caretakers or thought about my role as a domestic employer until I saw this work. Um, so, and then there's um, this cake thing here. Um, we were um, on Facebook, is one of the domestic worker groups in California that we had worked with around a nanny van event. Um, we randomly, after the event, found this um, picture of a cake that was made in the shape of a nanny van. It was orange. And um, it wasn't that they asked us 
um, what was, what, uh, which was fantastic. In other words, they felt so enfranchised and it was such a positive experience for them that they wanted to make a cake um, on the occasion of its one year anniversary. Um, so that was, um, that was an honor. Okay, so now I'm changing PowerPoints. Um, okay, this is a new project. Um, our studio for many years was next to this NGO called Peripheral Vision International, and they do work in Honduras. And um, they have an office as well in Brooklyn. And at the time, um, they were telling me about the work that they did, which, which is um, media advocacy and human rights. And um, they would do these video PSAs. So it might be a two minute video about how um, something like Zika or um, uh, you know, random public health um, service announcements um, that was important to them. And they would take a commercially pirated DVD and they would burn their video onto the four part of the DVD. So it plays before you see Terminator 2, for example, okay? And they would, um, these uh, bootlegs would then go out and they would be sold and distributed through these video halls, sold in the street, and in these video halls um, where people gather together and they watch multiple screens at once. Um, the majority of videos that come in um, are from Hollywood, Nollywood, or Bollywood. Um, and um, this, um, anyways, uh, I'll go into it in the video. Um, this is what the outside looks like. Um, and the context to this project um, that I'll share with you shortly is um, that in Uganda, the things that they were, um, there's significant human rights um, concerns. Um, so um, uh, as in, for example, a friend of ours who um, produces play with a gay man was thrown into jail. So alternative um, perspectives um, were really key um, and the arts play a really important role in um, discussing things that you can't normally discuss. Um, so encoding things. They asked me to, um, they said, you know, most of the stuff that, that comes in is commercially, you know, these commercial flicks. There's no alternative perspectives. Would you curate something that presents, we wanna know what alternative film and video looks like in the West. And there's a burgeoning community here um, and they were part of this conversation as well, and we want to know what that looks like. Um, so this is the project that, we, um, uh, that I curated, um, which features um, seven artists um, from the African diaspora.
Um, so then my collaborators in Uganda asked me, um, well, we wanted to make something um, anew. And um, in reflecting on my relationship with Uganda, um, which was kind of you know, incidental via this office mate of mine at the time, um, I noticed that on a lot of the video halls, there was these pictures of Bruce Lee, um, which I thought was curious. Um, and there's just like a general enthusiasm about Bruce Lee. Um, and I was thinking about when I grew up in Dallas, Texas, um, and I felt so invigorated when Bruce Lee was on my television, I, like Chinese Ecuadorian kid in Dallas, Texas. Um, he felt, he, I felt like he was my personal ambassador. Um, and so I started watching these Bruce Lee films again, and I kept on thinking about um, this scene in Enter the Dragon. Do you guys know the scene? Raise your hand if you know the scene. Okay. So um, Bruce Lee is getting busted up, and um, he can't see his enemy because he's in his hall of mirrors. And he remembers his sensei, is, is who says to him, um, to defeat, to vanquish the enemy, you must kill the illusion. And so I was like, what does that mean? How do I interpret that allegory about mirrors and looking and truth and deception and so forth? And I started thinking about um, how for me, um, I understand truth through another individual. Um, and so um, I would say, you know, I, I felt like I would, I wanted to make a project in which the other person, um, there was this process of looking and um, through this other person, you know, through another. Um, and I started um, by making these masks. Um, Snacks. Where you see yourself reflected in the other and also distorted. Um, and mirrors are one of the things that have um, um, always been an inspiration to artists from Rembrandt to Velasquez to Van Eyck um, to Mural Ugliz. Um, this is a sanitation truck. Um, where you see yourself implicated in what you're throwing out. Um, and so I kept on in New York um, making these vignettes with my collaborators, and I realized that it was such an interesting um, way to explore things that we would otherwise never talk about or interact around, and it was this way to explore these other um, states of affect. Um, and it would kind of draw out um, people's um, new narratives, or we felt like we were forging new myths, and it felt like an event. Um, so um, yeah, it, it encapsulated this idea of what Victor Turner calls betwixt and between, um, and also this idea that um, the liberatory nature of masks by the virtue that they conceal. Um, so I'm going to share with you this video um, that's a work in progress that um, I, I created with my collaborators in Uganda. <laughs>
So in these um, vignettes, we're exploring um, myths and rituals. And um, we thought of this scene as, um, uh, you know, there's many cultures around the world where there's a character who is ferrying or boating someone from one side to another um, and occupying this liminal space. Um, and um, I then have taken that project um, to other places, as in, over this past summer, I went with this family, um, a friend of mine who's from Kazakhstan, she invited me to go on this family vacation with her and her two daughters. Um, and she, I said, you know, I have to work on this, I have to work on this deadline, I have this, at this show at this museum in Utah. And she said, just bring it along, Let's, we'll just do it with you. So I was like, okay. So I went on this family vacation, and here we are. This is one of the uh, teenage daughters, Yerki. And we we're kind of exploring the history. Um, here we are in uh, Uzbekistan, and um, uh, we were this, the vignette was prompted by this, um, this kind of bridal hat. Um, so we were coming up with a story about these characters. Um, um, and people kind of, kind of get wrapped and folded into the thing and volunteer to be part, you know, show us and take us new places. This was the tour guide who got really excited about being in them and then took us to his favorite place, which is this lake. Um, and um, we next went to Azerbaijan. They were visiting um, a friend of um, a mutual colleague. And, um, you know, Azerbaijan is a place where there's also human rights issues and people, you know, um, this is my friend um, Faig Ahmed, who's um, uh, an artist who is also very aware of the role that he plays in coding information through the arts and it's a way to speak out um, in the midst of censorship. Um, this is um, not, uh, this is wrong, it's not featuring Sul Sultan. Um, this is an individual who um, wanted to be in this vignette, but couldn't we, um, he didn't want his name to be associated with it because um, professionally he might be compromised if he was um, shown wearing a shirt. Um, we thought of this uh, vignette as the breakup. Um, so here they are, um, these pieces in a museum. Um, right now, intervented both, uh, there's some in a kind of gallery setting, and then there's some that are kind of intervented, like the one about um, death, that with the driver, um, she's intervented in this hall with mummies. Um, and then there's this red room of their demons or ghosts. Um, okay, so the last um, project that I'm gonna share with you and end with um, is, um, well, I'm gonna just start it and you'll see. Recently, I was alarmed from the caught sight of these headlines in the news. We analyzed where we see the sound. They show women have been reporting problems with the Maria IUD for years. Shit. Was that the IUD that I had? Can you, sorry, can we bump up the sound? and was relieved to find that my ID was a different model and make. That got me remembering a conversation I had with my gynecologist. So, what's your contraception plan after you give birth? Uh, I don't know. But all I know is that I'm hella fertile. Ever tried the copper ID? No. Well, what does the copper do? Well, in a small device I put into the uterus, the copper acts as a spermicide. Whoa! Copper ions are zapping the sperm? Well, we don't really know what's happening with the copper. The ions are doing their thing. But it has a 99% effective rate. Around the world, it's been more popular. 41% of Chinese women use it, 23% of French women, 27% of Norwegian women, and it's gaining popularity in the U.S. Okay, sure. Anything except for the pill. So after the birth of my son, the thing got popped in. And now, looking at these headlines, I couldn't stop thinking about those covers. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a team of scientists in Florida who are trying to harness the energy from lightning. 
They send a rocket outfitted with a copper nose into the air, and under the right atmospheric conditions, the copper ions induce a lightning storm. The energy travels down to the ground via co a coil of copper wire. And I began to wonder if me and my IUD outfitted with this highly conductive copper, if we were standing near that rocket, do you think I would fail a tingle in my cooch? <laughs> and I started to wonder about the way that copper sutures the natural and built environment coursing through our bodies, homes, and motherboards. Mining copper is seen by some as a relatively harmless extraction process, a necessary evil, even enabling ecological solutions. And I started wondering about who is doing this earth moving. A copper was first mined in 8000 BCE on the island of Cyprus, home of Venus of Aphrodite, which is how they share the same alchemical symbol that was later taken up by the women's liberation movement. Copper has been used in contraceptive devices for millennia. Most recently, it was used in the IUD starting in the late 60s. Contraception advocates like Margaret Sanger saw the IUD as a tool to liberate women and encourage pleasure. But by the 60s and 70s, corporations, population control advocates, uh, and NGOs positioned the IUD as an essential sterilization device that could control America's low income, indigenous and immigrant communities, and solve the, quote, population bomb of the global south. Millions of women were given the IUD without their consent or economically incentivized to accept the IUD. But many of these women, especially in patriarchal societies where they felt it wasn't safe, and safe to openly challenge their husbands, saw the IUD as an invisible long-term contraception device that gave them the ability to control their bodies and lives. Problematically, one of the IUDs used by 2.5 million women was the Plaston Dalcon Shield. Does anybody here remember that coming up? Um, released on the market in 1971 without adequate testing. The device's multi-filament stream carried bacteria from the vagina into the uterus, which led to an increased likelihood of infections, septic abortions, and infertility. Eight, 18 women died, 200,000 reported serious injuries, and after 12,000 lawsuits and mass uproar, the Dalkin Shield was finally pulled off the market in the late 80s, it was a while after, and the pharmaceutical company went bankrupt. Since that time, scientific advances improved the safety of the IUD. And in the early 2000s, after memories of the Dalkin Shield faded, the copper IUD was reintroduced to moms in the global north, like me, as a means of family planning. Which brings us to today. So a week after Trump was elected, Planned Parenthood saw a 900% rise in women requesting the IUDs, a contraception that would outlast Trump's presidency. Uncertainty in the Supreme Courts also drove up the number of IUD numbers, as did the Supreme Court confirmation of Kavanaugh. While anti-choice conservatives attempt to rewrite science and scientists push back, Advocacy organizations are doubling down on campaigns that affirm the right to, you, to choose, and reaper justice organizations continue to focus on the way that women of color have traditionally faced economic and systemic barriers in gaining access to contraceptive technology. So against the complex history of the IUD and its bright future, the IUD for many of us today is a tool enabling self-determination and desire. It's an antenna connecting me with 170 million women across the world who also have copper antenna, and I want to create a monument commemorating our collective biopower. I want to solder my ID to a lightning rod that sits atop a very tall building, besting it by an inch. Imagine as the bolt of lightning strikes the IUD radiating into the atmosphere, a tingle resounding in the name of repro justice, technological self-determination, and women's desire. So this is just the start of the project. As I'm working on a book and a film and public art components, um, I'll also be revealing them or engaging people on so social media. And with that, we have respondents. <laughs>
mother or partner. Um, I have, as I was telling students today, I have no noun that kind of um, logically is attributed to my work, so I just string a lot of the nouns that I am all together. So thank you for living through that. And thank you, Steve and Sasha. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this conversation with you. Um, so let me just begin um, by talking a little bit about Marissa's work. I want to thank you for how bold and challenging it is. It's, it's visceral and it, it is forever searching like a divining rod for the best medium, the best media, the best place and space and partnership. And the best impact and dialogue and partners. And um, your work really illustrates that kind of searching. Um, so as collaborative it is and as multidimensional, it doesn't include everything. Um, those kind of choices have to be really carefully made and rigorous and really tested. You know, why a film, why an app, why a road trip or an experimental film? There has to be a reason that you use the tools that are available, not just because um, they're like, available. If we use everything, it becomes beige and it really blanks out the integrity of form and medium, and it doesn't create anything new to offer um, or any unknown questions or reflections. Instead, it loses its integrity and its interest <laughs> and its identity. And I think as artists, um, we are always going towards the tension. Um, that's what we will talk about. Um, we're going towards the questions, the reality that doesn't exist that we're hoping to create until it is reality, the kinds of things we don't know. Um, the failures that are incredibly rich, even if um, we hope no one sees them. And so I really feel like we go through and towards those kinds of tensions. Um, and I think of work like an ecology, I was actually talking to students today about that, and your work feels much the same. And in an ecology, it depends on reciprocal relationships, and that's between any of them. So it's not just people or partnerships, it's, it's sound, it's form, it's experience. Um, and those elements are not equal, but they're equitable. Um, and one of the examples I was talking about today in, in our round table was really about oxygen in the water. And right now, I need oxygen. Um, but don't make me choose between oxygen and water because I'll need water next. But I don't need it now. And so there's an equity between the relationship, not in the form. And to really think about each element being necessary, irreplaceable, and different, and the idea of exploiting difference. And that really comes through in the work that you do, um, the different approaches and why you come to your work in different ways. Um, it also speaks a lot about collaboration and um, thinking about the elements that um, you don't often use and how they weaken systems how we don't think in very cohesive ways and understand what we're ignoring. And often that doesn't show up in work. Like malnutrition, it sometimes shows up over time, but not immediately. And so you can make really wonderful work, um, but leaving great voids and weaknesses, and it may show up in impact, or it may show up in the way the depth of participation or engagement it may also show up just in the integrity of the work and, and how much it can live and hold and the kind of lives um, that it can have. So some of the questions that I was thinking about when I was looking at Marissa's work is really about how to decide on them. I think those of us that create things across a lot of mediums really um, have to work very hard to understand the forms that we choose. And when people try to put you into a silo or into a genre or into a field, how, how do you help them understand the place from which you meet and engage in your work? Um, you work and collaborate in ways that are not the same and that really break boundaries. And the work that Marissa does, I'm going to go back between you and Marissa because I think somehow I wrote it that way, so I hope she is always you. Um, she's also always my <coughs> um, But I wonder how you define expectations of a medium that has a long history, um, like film, um, you know, like oral history. 
and really understanding um, you know, why you're choosing those things. And so for me, it, it really makes me think a lot about um, queer space and how I kind of simply use the framework of queer space might be to think about um, space in which appropriate, appropriate certain aspects of the material and social world in which we all live and composes them into counter constructions to create the freer space of expression, resistance, space to be the other, also to be yourself on your own terms, the less defined, the less regulated. And queer space is useful in a framework of assessing political and cultural change and interventions, both by what is changed and what needs to be changed, and who we become through that process. So it's really about um, kind of all tenses of the verb, past, present, and future. Um, where we've come from, where we are, and where we're going. And not though only those of us who identify as queer, but also part of a place-making practice um, that describes a new understanding of space, enabling the production of queer counter publics. That, that often means creating spaces that didn't exist um, and that don't exist and are undefined. For me, I'm always engaging in the construction and investigating that kind of space and existence, and I think Marissa is also. Um, you're also working to create spaces that um, create communities that might not be there. So even though domestic workers might all, all, all define themselves as domestic workers, through your road trip, they may define themselves as part of the man, -man which is yet another community and engagement. Um, a lot of really risky work can do that. It can create communities that don't exist. It's really kind of exploiting, in the best sense of the word, the idea of being part of a tribe, coming from a tribe, and being part of different um, that happens in um, interracial um, children, right? It happens in queer individuals, people living with different kinds of abilities, um, nationalities. The idea that we see ourselves as a part of multiple communities, some that exist and some that don't. And Marissa really allows for these kind of revelations in new and really tripped up platforms. Um, it is the invisible as a tool a political state and an aesthetic that I think that Melissa employs. You know, creating books that are eaten or stolen and inviting people to, um, as she said, sacrifice for pleasure, right? Or enjoy sacrifice as a pleasure. Whether she sneaks inside a well-oiled media robe stream in Uganda, and I've actually spent a lot of time in Uganda, and it's really like, this work is rogue on top of rogue on top of rogue, meets experiential, meets experimental. And it's really a very interesting thing that she is able to actually kind of bootleg a bootleg operation and surprise them by injecting experimental videos. Um, it's really about the, the collage of the scene and the unseen by the scene and the unseen. And what Marissa really does is add oxygen and audiences to experiences and narratives we think we might know. Um, just using the last work, you know, an IUD, periodic table, copper, climate, self-determination, electrical fields, reproductive rights, and let's not forget sex, I and mean, you don't need an IUD if you're not having sex with the opposite sex that you could possibly get pregnant. Um, so one thing that I just want to end on, thinking about your work, and something you did kind of bring up is, and a question that I engage a lot too, is that socially engaged, which also in impactful work, often comes up that there are no best practices, or how do you understand best practices? And are there techniques and practices that everyone should be using? And how can the idea of a best practice actually relate to socially engaged <coughs> relevant art when in fact the practice actually is reflecting a porous relationship and nature of necessity to society and how it's changing. And so maybe best practices would work at one time and not another, or in one situation, or with one partnership or medium and not another. And is it actually acceptable to articulate ideal practices? Is there a right way to allow art making an autonomy and um, a kind
kind of um, freedom and ambiguity to exist and search out what it needs to be, while also understanding um, best practices and what are the, the best ways to do work that's impactful um, and also engage artistic excellence. How do you create tools that challenge assumptions in society and also are judged and assessed by society in those systems? Um, I think that I would just like to end with thanking you um, for your courage to employ genres in free and almost relentless ways um, and really crossing social borders of race and class and gender and geography. Your work is part artwork, part news vehicle, part cultural critique, part collage, part oral history, part humorous relief, which we need even more of. And you also play with a kind of temporal quality um, of experience. You play with the unexpected and the planned. Um, and you often come up with some things. It's especially um, kind of uh, feels unusual for me uh, to be in because this is not uh, explicitly a uh, series on education or on teaching and learning. Um, but I come, I have, uh, as indicated, a background that is both in the arts but also very deeply in education because I realized um, with it, I have a theater background, but I realized very early on in my growth and development as an artist that there were things that I couldn't understand about the work that I was trying to do in theater without teaching them. I couldn't find another way to get the insights that I wanted and needed and understanding that I and needed without teaching. Um, and that has, uh, that was a pretty long time ago and it's kept me going for the last 40 plus years on uh, trying to understand the relationship between artistic work and educational work. I just wonder how many people here um, identify as teachers. Um, and listen, I, I, uh, I think you know, but most don't. I don't hear very well. I can hear aids, but I can't word discriminate. In, in the Care Force video, there's a uh, Early on, you identify yourself with three words. Do you remember what they are? Um, domestic employer? Is it domestic, someone who employs a caregiver? Um, I, the words that I thought I heard were artist something, oh. mom. Um, I think it said artist teacher. teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said artist teacher and mom. So I, th I thought you did, but then I got worried that you didn't. I just made it up because it's what I wanted. <laughs> you know, it's part of what you do and you don't understand what people are saying. Um, so, uh, so, so there's a lot of teachers here, and how many are students? Okay, I think I hope all of them go up. Um, in, in a sense, uh, I come from uh, the the feeling that there is a very deep connection between artistic work and practice, teaching and learning, practice education, work and practice. And Jane, I very much appreciate your phrase about artists going toward the question, which I feel uh, is also what we uh, should be doing when we're teaching and what we should be doing when we're learning. That is not just going for answers, but going for the deeper and deeper and more complex and more compelling and harder to answer questions. Um, and art and uh, art serves as a kind of inquiry process, and I think um, teaching and learning uh, 
also serve as a kind of artistic enterprise. That is, there's there are very strong similar dimensions between them. A very strong aesthetic dimension in learning, a very strong social dimension in learning, um, and, and in art. Obviously, a strong intellectual, strong ethical dimensions as well, and certainly political dimensions. So, um, so I, I come and I, and I watch and I listen to this talk about this and present this kind of dazzling array of, of projects that she's involved in, which are not simply artistic projects. I mean, they're design projects, they're activist projects, they're organizing projects, and they're, and they're own projects. And I, I just want to try to uh, talk about two quick things that, from a learning perspective, that I think Marissa's work helps to illuminate and also question the work about the work and about, and about in general the work that um, folks doing engaged in this kind of artistic enterprise. So, um, so in thinking uh, more and more in the last couple of years about socially engaged practices and public participatory practices, um, I've been thinking about it, trying to think about it through uh, those practices, through a learning lens. And one of the things that um, seems uh, almost too obvious to state, but um, therefore incredibly important to state, is that there's no learning without engagement. Um, in other words, learning is not so easy. Um, you can learn some easy things, fairly easy, but the hard things to learn are hard. They take a lot of work, and they take sustained engagement. And anybody who's ever taught in the classroom knows that you've got your um, work set out for you because from what I think of as the first three minutes, first three minutes of, of a term, first three minutes of a class, you have to get the learner uh, or your students to make a decision that they, once again, want to engage with the work on a deeper level. That is, they want to do the work involved in this learning. And um, one of the beautiful things about looking back and forth and working back and forth across art and education is that artists are deeply committed to the problem of not just the first three minutes of interaction time, but the first 10 seconds, the first 30 seconds. In other words, if I don't get people to pay attention quickly, and if I don't grab them and hold them so that they begin to become not just um, present, but fully engaged, then I've lost them. I've lost them as a teacher. I've lost them as an artist. So whether I frame my intentions as an artist and as learning intentions or as learning goals, whether I do that or not, I still have that problem of how to get and hold attention. And to deepen that intention as I keep someone engaged, so that they, so in a sense, I'm doing less and less of the work, and they're doing more and more of the work. And part of what I think, you know, if we were to go back and just play through again all of these projects, that you were describing, that uh, there is a remarkable, almost encyclopedia of, of um, approaches to grabbing attention. And I'll just name a couple of them that I, that I captured as we were um, looking. Grabbing attention, holding attention, and encouraging people to go deep. First of all, a number of your projects, it seem to me, are almost framed as journey, certainly care for us. Is, is there's a, a journey of quality. And there's a, I love that video, it's, and, and, the, and the whole notion of the project has come along with us on this journey, which is one of the, the um, sometimes explicit and sometimes um, implicit ways that teachers can get people to come with, to be passionate about something, and to say, come with me on this, because I'm going to find something out and I want you to come with me. I just, um, I want to be careful about time. I'll just, you hold on back on that, but I think there are, it's so many. Well, I've mentioned the people 
who, um, it's so counterintuitive, you know, like in classrooms, you just wouldn't think, okay, what I want to do is scare the shit out of the kids so that I'll get their stories. But there's so much playfulness and in this idea of terrorizing and so much joy in what you created there, what the community created there, as a, a, a kind of energy that yielded up stories from people. This is from an arts and literacy perspective. If you just go back into much more traditional settings, from an arts and literacy, setting, this is gold. This is what you want to be doing, to get young people with all of this energy to get down on their hands and knees and start designing making and creating stories and books. Um, I think that the, the last thing that I wanted to um, raise, again from a learning perspective, is a question about, and you raise the question of success. How do you, how do you know whether any of these projects are a success? And that's a big question for me because um, every, every term, every year, uh, that I'm teaching, I have the exact same question. Like, did this work? Did we get somewhere? Where did we go? Um, are people in a different place than they started? Do they understand things that they didn't before? Can they, can they um, engage with the world in a different way than they could before? Can they solve problems that they couldn't solve before? So those are questions that are very hard to answer. And, and I'm, I'm thinking more and more. I mean, I know that the problem with the kind of work that you do and many others do, um, particularly in the sort of kind of public participatory and socially engaged one, where it is the interaction, it, it is with people that the work has to happen. It's not just a question of creating um, objects. It's about creating experiences. And, and the question is about documentation, because it's very, these are ephemeral. It's very important to document. And, the, and the, the question is, in documenting, what do you focus on? So in a lot of these, we were seeing what, getting the, the quick version, obviously, all of these could have been opened up. Um, but what we got less of was a sense of what it was actually like to be there as a child, to be there as a domestic worker, to be there in any of these contexts that you created, and, and, and to engage and be in that experience over time. And I think that one of the, the challenges for, um, for many of us as educators in order to answer this question for ourselves about success, that is, what is the meaning of this experience that we're trying to create, is to figure out the ways to document not only the work that we've created, that is, the space, but the experience that other people have in that space. Okay. Thanks. Um, so maybe I'll respond first to those questions and then take other questions. Um, but so the, the question, um, one of your questions was about um, the something not being a logical uh, solution to how to get kids excited about literacy. Um, and um, I'll say that um, what seemed to me was, um, I was thinking about Santa Claus and even when you, um, by the way, Bigel Bendito is bigger than Santa Claus in that part of northern Honduras. Um, but there's a delight in pretending as if you believe in Santa Claus, even if, if when you don't believe. And there's a delight in pretending like you do. Um, and if you think about um, when you're around a campfire as a kid, um, it's fun to pretend like you believe in ghosts and you're getting scared. Um, so it's what some people call the magical as if. Um, and the other point, um, it also answers in part, um, my, my mother was a Berlitz teacher for a short period of time. Do you guys know what Berlitz is? Language acquisition, like these language shapes. And the strategy of Berlitz that she, you know, she would use it with me in the household, was that you come up with these really absurd associations and like these very visual associations. Um, so oftentimes, I mean, it's impl in, impacted my work because I'm trying to come up with something that's so wacky that you can't get it out of your head. Um, and it also makes me recall um, 
the conversation I had with the director of the Care Force film, when he, you know, we were scripting it out, because Brendan is scripted, um, we were, he asked me to describe how he came up with the idea of the Care Force, which is guess, guessing the film. And it seemed to me actually quite logical. Um, so part of it's maybe being, um, I don't know, um, wayward. <laughs> um, it seemed logical to me that that's how you would go and meet people in another place and what I would do with my child. Um, and then let's see, to your questions, your questions were about ecology, um, queer space, and um, oh, best practices. Um, so best practices, I think, um, user testing, which is not really a strategy that you learn in art school. It's something that you learn maybe in comparative media studies or in media production or in film or like technology or in architecture, or like any other thing. I, I really don't understand. <laughs> I mean, maybe you have like crits, you know, a couple of crits and then you like put it out in the world, which seemed, seems crazy to me. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm interested in um, a scale um, and the scale might be invisible to some people, um, but in order to make something work, I need to get feedback from a lot of people, and necessarily I also need to involve, um, you know, the people who it's I'm seeking to be in dialogue with. I need to involve them from the get-go in the project itself. Um, so I think of co-design like um, it's like dating. You don't want to get married, you know, right off the bat. You know, you want to go out for coffee and then you want to get to know them and to see how they write or what their texts are like and so forth. And so you kind of get to know. And I might do, I oftentimes I'm doing kind of short um, projects to get to know what that relationship is like. Um, as in, it's common that you, um, an advocacy organization or like I'll work with lawyers and they really don't know what to do with an artist or what that even looks like. And so oftentimes the first thing they think of is, um, oh, can you design a flyer? And uh, there, a lot of artists will say, no, I'm this is beyond me, but I feel like, I mean, I happen to have, I taught myself graphic design, I enjoy doing it. It's really easy for me to do that, and it's a service, and it's just a way to start the conversation. I mean, it's like, can I borrow, a, you know, a spoonful of sugar from your neighbor kind of thing, and start, I don't know, whatever. So it's like, a, I'm happy for it to start off in kind of transactions. And, um, John Seeley Brown, who is at Microsoft and he started off in education, um, he wrote this business manual in the 90s when the US was starting to offshore some of their labor. And the book, uh, this book is about managing those relationships. And there's a whole chapter on what he calls productive friction. Um, and he also talks about in collaboration in a way that I thought was useful for artists working with other disciplines or sectors. Um, and he describes that there's three levels of collaboration, and the first one is transactional levels. Um, and um, then it kind of moves up to being integrated in which you're sharing staff and resources. So um, I think it's helpful to um, students um, or you know, people who are wanting to engage in these kind of practices to understand that it's, um, you, know, you kind of like start, it's a sequence, you know, and it kind of culminates. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Right there. <laughs> um, in that uh, the thing you did for the uh, <laughs> NYC Immigrant Affairs mm -hmm. literacy stuff, those typewriters, what were those typewriters? Oh, oh, that was in the Bibli Bandito, like the typewriters that yeah. we made out of cardboard? Like, why typewriters? Were they, were they cardboard? <laughs> were they actual devices? Well, we, so with the kids in New York City around Bilo Bandito, we, um, the New York City workshop was, we were doing literacy, 21st century literacy. So they were learning, um, we were teaching them the software called PopcornJS, um, which Mozilla was um, putting forward and we partnered with them on that project. And the theme was Bilo Bandito. And so we also like filmed um, an episode um, of Bibli Bandi to ourselves and kind of wrote the script and come up with like the costumes and so forth and we decided that we needed um, a bunch of kids who um, were these kind of scouts who um, um, were trying to lure Bibli Bandito to coming to the Big Apple. So that's what we made cardboard computer. Uh, like, so they were, they, were, they were cardboard, they weren't actual. Like, yeah. Okay. It's like, yeah. I like that. 
Um, we talk a lot about the co-design process. I'm just kind of curious in, when you're traveling overseas to Uganda or to Honduras or what have you, um, when you're done with the project, do you follow up with the folks that were involved afterwards, or is it just something that you just sort of create and you allow them to sort of take on and, and, and take further direction? Um, that's a really good question. Um, really, my partnerships end up being multi-year, as in, um, like, eight, I mean, I think I'm working on three different things that are developing over since for the past decade, um, and they start from kind of transactional or you know, like, just kind of slow dating space, um, and then we check in afterwards and we kind of see where things are at, and sometimes things come up, and so. Um, with the um, Video Sync Uganda, there's another group recently who was like, oh, that's great, we want to do this linking too. We're like, okay, well, here's what we learned. Um, so, did that answer your question? Yeah, well, I was just kind of curious because I guess what I'm trying to get at is, um, I'm just curious like, how involved you are after you leave this Oh, position. okay. I feel like that's a good, um, in terms of best practices, it falls into that question too. Um, I very carefully choose the organizations that I seek to partner with. Um, the criteria, um, uh, one of them is that I look for groups on the ground um, who are poised to achieve victory, and victory can be however they define it. So they're on the ground, like I worked with an NGO in Honduras who's already doing multiple programs there. In Uganda, it's this NGO plus this community of artists and filmmakers there, um, and so forth. Um, and we kind of decide on what that phasing is like. Um, and sometimes something comes out and we're like, oh, that was unexpected. What if it, we now do this? Um, so, yeah. Can you list some of the other criteria? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, well, I look for organizations that have the, um, where it's one person, one person who can then parlay communication from a wider network, as in National Domestic Workers Alliance is an alliance of 10,000 women um, with um, chapters, 46 chapters in something like 23 states all across the United States. I work on a national level, I check in with like one person on a national level or sometimes, sometimes different people, um, one person on like a regional level, different states, uh, local level, city level, borough level. Um, but I need to be in contact with one person as opposed to if I'm in conversation with six people and then it is like too many cooks in the kitchen. But so like there's a funnel. Um, I also look for organizations where they have the creative capacity to engage in collaboration, which um, is not always the case. As in creative capacity might be um, they're too busy. Like Trump got elected and a lot of the groups I was working with, like we're just putting out fires, we don't have time to do something that's like outside of putting out fires, for example. Um, it also is, our, I also look for individuals who um, uh, need, I have identified already that they need creativity to solve the, something that they're seeking to tackle. Um, so I don't go in assuming I'm going to convince someone. I'm looking for people who are already wanting that. Um, and then I look for organizations that um, can kind of get humor or, I mean, Bilo Bendito, there's like an edge there. Do you know what I mean? So if they don't, that's what I feel like I can bring to the world. So. You know what, part of that question is also about like membership. <laughs> oh, OK, yeah. yeah I, I, like, you know, like what stays and that's a that's a good question. So, um, in usually in the art world, there's the individual author, um, and then the other people like don't get credited in ways that I think are actually important too. Um, I use the theater model of authorship in which there's um, the original scripter may or may not be involved with the adaptation of the thing onto the stage. And there's the lighting person who gets credited, and there's the costume designer who gets credited, and then the iteration of, or you know, how it gets deployed depends on the energy from the audience and what's working. Um, so that's how I think of authorship. Um, I feel like when something goes out in the world and goes beyond my being there, um, then I feel like it's a success, and I feel like it's also tapped well, on a different level. It's tapped into this. There's something for me there that's in this idea of a death drive and also a transcendence. 
You know what I mean? It's like the IUD on the building being atomized into bits. <laughs> it's like just But um, yeah, or like millions of ilu bandiditos. I, this, that, to me, that would be a dream come true. <laughs> Thank you.